right, today we're going to be talking about testing music in the church. Um, this is based on an article uh, from Sandy Simpson, who's right next to me. Sandy's going to give you a little bit of his background. Um, uh, just so you know, my background is I played in the uh, secular music world for a long time. I'm a career drummer and percussionist. I've done uh, gigs with secular bands such as Gary Lewis and the Playboys, the Coaster, the Coasters, Chuck Berry, many others. And uh, after I was saved in uh, 1994, I then proceeded to play with some musical art artists, uh, Darlene Check and Hill Songs, Jeff Ben Holt, Lincoln Brewster, uh, Paul Balash, and some of the folks from Integrity Music. Well, one of the problems today that we have in the churches is that too many uh, churches today are allowing music to be used in their services, which is not glorifying to the Lord and can actually be a hindrance to the teaching of sound doctrine. Pastors and leaders should be using their leadership role to test what is being played and sung in their churches. Though some are quick to test preaching and teaching from their pulpits, many ignore the music being used in the services. This is a tragic mistake. Music is a powerful medium, as it's we both know. It's very powerful. <laughs> it, is, it is something that affects deeply the body, mind, and emotions. It is a proven fact that music often stays with a person far longer uh, than what is taught or preached. Songs uh, roam around in our heads, especially if the melody appeals to us. What is often overlooked is the serious impression music makes on people and the teaching they are getting over and over again as they allow the song to repeat in their minds and on their lips. Music teaches things much more subtly, yet sometimes far more effectively. Yeah. And, of course, there's a solution to the problem, and the solution being that's why the lyrical content uh, of music in the church, as well as its effect on the spiritual lives of those who perform and listen, should be vigorously examined by the leaders of the church. I'm not, uh, Sandy was not suggesting in any way, shape, or form, form that it be done in a legalistic way. Church leaders um, do not want to discourage the youth, uh, for example, for leading singing and worship in the church, but discernment in the area of music must be done nonetheless. Uh, shepherds have an obligation from the Lord to protect their flocks. It should be uh, established by the church leaders that any music done in the church will be held up to the same scrutiny as any other teaching or materials used yep. in the church. If you uh, would not allow a, any book or just any Sunday school material, any magazine to be displayed on the church, then why would you allow music that has unsound doctrine and might cause people right. to sin? Now, Sandy... Uh, Tell us a little bit about your background. How did, how did you sure. first get started in music? Well, I've been uh, doing music for a long time. I started playing guitar when I was about 12, and I started writing music when I was about uh, 15, and um, been doing it ever since, and uh, eventually got involved in uh, music production. Uh, uh, we produced a number of Christian albums as uh, for ourselves and others with a guy by the name of Jeff Johnson out of Arc Records. Also did a lot of uh, commercial music, hundreds of jingles, you know, local, regional, national. So I did that for about 15 years until the Lord really called me to go out to Micronesia and become a missionary. But I, I was very happy to go out there because I wanted to do concerts through all the islands um, and evangelism, et cetera. And so I spent uh, 10 years doing that, and now I'm, now I'm in Hawaii. But, uh, yeah, I have a long background in music, and that's why I felt, and I was glad that you asked me to do this, because I think that we're qualified to talk on this particular issue. Um, there, there are many doors to churches these days. It's not just through the pulpit. It, there's the door of the bookstores and the, and the music ministry and and the, the children's ministry and, and all kinds of different ways for things to be introduced into the church, which is why church leadership needs to be aware of what's coming in. Often they are much more aware of, uh, you know, who they invite to the church to speak, for instance, and things like that, but then they kind of let the music go. And the problem is, is that there are a lot of churches and movements out there that are u absolutely using music to try to basically uh, diaprax people, to get them into their mode of thinking. And they do it very subtly. They'll put in phrases in there. They'll put in ideas 
that are somewhat subtle and maybe can be thought of in a different way, but they do it on purpose. And the more you sing it in your mind and, and in the church, the more brainwashed you become with these ideas. And there are obviously good ideas to, to be you know, uh, taught, but there are some real bad ideas in music. And I'm not just talking about modern music. There are some bad ones in the old hymns, too. And that's why on my site, I decided to start a thing that's called the a worship uh, song ratings page. And, you know, so that people can hopefully help them to be able to understand how to do this, how to look at a song critically. Now, I'm not talking about the... Different um, style. I'm not talking about style, because right. style is a very nebulous thing. And there are many good styles out there. Uh, there, there are some styles that, frankly, are somewhat demonic, from different cultures, but basically style is not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the motive and intent of the person who wrote the song and primarily the lyrics. The lyrical content is the most important thing. So we're not talking about instrumentation. No. Either there are people that are dead set against using right. any kind of instruments in the church, especially drums and percussion. Yeah, you're a but, drummer and yeah. so you, you always get the... Uh, the I know, bad the part, black, yeah. but you know the the thing is, is that we know that drums were used in in worship in in back back in Israel, in the Old Testament. We timbrels. They used a timbrel or mm -hmm. a toff, and it was a, a, an instrument with a skin on it, and they used sticks to hit it. So yes, um, there was definitely a rhythmic aspect to the music back then, and uh, I just don't agree with this whole idea that drums of, are of the devil at all. But um, I'm more concerned with, with the lyrical content that's coming through in many songs today. Uh, a lot of the third wave, new apostolic, emergent church, um, word of faith ideas come through these songs. And this is why it's so important to find out where those songs are coming from. What church is this guy involved with that wrote this song? Right. Because then you will know, you'll have a context to know what he's actually saying in the song. Right. And that brings up a, a band like Jesus Culture, where right. if you don't know they're connected with Bethel Church and Phil Redding and the heretical things that are taught right. there, um, I, I can tell you from listening to some of the music, it's some of the best produced, yeah. and the, their players are, are, are decent, sure. good players. But what kind of theology yes. is, is behind all of the Jesus culture thing? And the Jesus culture, we're just lately in the, uh, uh, in the Passion Conference, and, and, and so they're becoming more mainstream. And again, it's a, it, just like you spoke about the diaprax, it's a slow, uh, yeah. a, a slow thing to slowly get people to yeah. accept a false doctrine, which yeah. is really behind uh, much of what Jesus culture represents. And a lot of these authors are very clever. They will put in a phrase that they know that figuratively a different person might take a different way. And so it's okay for them to sing it. But you got to find out what the original, like for instance, if, if this song is a Bethel so church song, you better find out what they're actually saying in this song. Because, you know, it, it's really important that we make sure that we're we're teaching sound doctrine in the churches and not just picking up on, on every little thing that comes through. There are a number of things going on these days that are a concern to me. One of them is this whole uh, idea of basically taking Song of Solomon out of context and these sort of lovey-dovey songs to Jesus. You know, talk, you know, talking about Jesus in sexual terms in these songs. This is very much promoted by IHOP and, uh, and Mike Bickle. And some so, other songs that are like my friend Steve Camp right. uh, would say, God is my girlfriend. Exactly. Type, type of song. And, you know, they're, they're very blasphemous. And yet a lot of churches are picking up on this now. It's becoming, a, you know, and it's like, well, I'm singing a love song to Jesus. Well, that's fine to tell Jesus you love him. But it's another thing to say, lay me down and, and, and have sex with me. And that's basically what some of these songs are talking about. Mm -hmm. And that is absolutely blasphemous. And people better be careful about singing songs like that. Another, another thing that they often do is they'll put in catchphrases from the third wave, like jump in the river. Well, a lot of people... All the river songs. All the river songs. And mm -hmm. a lot of churches don't know what jump, jump in the river means. 
they think, oh, well, I can assign to that whatever value I want to, you know. Get, it, get involved in the church or something. But jump in the river has a very specific meaning. It's talking about getting involved in the false anointing. It's get, getting, in, getting slain in the spirit, etc. Do you really want your church people singing that and getting involved with that? That's the question. Well, and, and what I found out, too, is the, the shallowness of some of the uh, worship leaders that are out there. I mean, they're allowing uh, back in black, yeah. uh, or, or, you know, or highway to hell yeah. being played in the church well, now. Well, that's another big up thing on, Up on the platform. Right. I'm on a highway to hell. And the thing, uh, when I first got into praise and worship uh, music, the first thing I noticed is it's set up like when I used to play rock concerts in, in the stadiums. Um, we always start out kicking it hard, uh, playing uh, fast, upbeat songs. Then we'd slow, slow it, down, it down, and then we would end it, you know, um, with it with, with usually some kind of upbeat yeah, tune. Yeah, that's right. Um, and and you have to examine some of the shallowness. Where would this come from? Uh, we're going to show a clip on uh, Jen Johnson. Uh, she's connected with Bethel uh, by relation, actually. She's one of the worship leaders of Bethel. Uh, okay. And that, this will kind of probably offend you, but oh well. And the Holy Spirit to me is like the genie from Aladdin. I view the Holy Spirit like the genie from Aladdin. And he's blue. Unplanned. Perfect. And he's funny. And he's sneaky. And he's courageous. And he's everywhere. And he's wonderful. That's who he is to me. And he's funny. And he's sneaky. And he's silly. He's wonderful. And I view him like the genie from Aladdin. I don't know where in my life that just kind of like came up. Maybe when I was like 10, I don't know, but... Because he's there, you know? And he's, he's the helper and he's just always supportive and comforting and he's just fun. And he's blue. Ah, okay, hold on. Good point, good color. Um, apart from that, there's been so much pressure uh, put on uh, all the churches to have a praise and worship band. Right. So now, because of that pressure and because of, of, of doing that thing, um, they've allowed people to come in into church and play right. that couldn't make it out in the world. And there was that a good often happens. Th and and th there's a good reason. It's because they didn't want to practice. Yeah. And, and I, I've always been amazed on praise and worship teams how it's so hard to get people to rehearse for an hour or two a week. Mm -hmm. Just think if the president, any U.S. president, um, or an important dignitary would be coming to your church. You would prepare for weeks for something like right. that. But yet we're performing... Yeah. Uh, and we're worshiping the God of the universe, our right. Savior, right. and yet uh, we can't even put in an hour of practice right. to that, you know? Right. And, and, and another abominable practice is bringing in ringers, unsaved people on That's, your, on your that platform. That happens a lot now. You know, that are good players, but they're yeah. not even saved, you know? Well, it's, it's all come in with the paradigm of, the, of church, you know, church growth. Uh, you want to do things that are going to attract people. And so entertainment has become a very big thing um, and because you want to get the maximum amount of people in your church. But, you know, things have changed over time. It used to be when we would sing together in a church, people were actually singing. They were, yeah, you know, there, there's some downside to reading everything off a page and reading the notes. But frankly, I learned how to read music by singing from a hymn book. And we all sang. Everybody sang. Everybody was involved. Everybody was singing the words. We were learning how to sing parts. Now, it's a situation where people are being entertained. They sit back 
A lot of them don't even sing. Maybe they dance around and raise their hands, but they don't learn how to sing. They don't learn parts. The, the music is so loud that they can't hardly <laughs> think. And it's all emotion-based. Everything is, like you said, you start out with the, with the upbeat stuff, and then you go down to the lower, you bring them down, and then you come back up at the end. Mm -hmm. It's all an emotion situation instead of focusing on what you're actually singing about. People will be singing stuff. I can't, a lot of times I'll go to a church and I can't even sing what's being done because it's so shallow and meaningless. I don't want to repeat that over and over again. And yet people are kind of forced to do that in that situation. Yeah. Now music is one way that we worship God. We should worship him once we head out those doors too and worship exactly. him with, with well, our lives. Actually, that's the point of worship. It's not, that's what I don't like it. The song part being defined as worship. Right. That's become the definition of worship now. That's, that's not, not the true. definition no. of worship. The definition of worship in the Bible is obeying God. Obey, obey His commands and do what He wants you to do. And that encompasses all of life. That means we should be worshiping God with our whole life, not just when we're sitting in a, in a song service. And the problem is we don't really fear, we don't have a healthy fear of God and, and which means we really don't know who he is. That's right. So many times, and I've played That's in big problem. churches where, you know, hey, I'm not against serving coffee in there, but now they're bringing it into the sanctuary with their snacks or whatever. And you, they come in when the music starts playing. And, and that, to me, that is so disrespectful to oh, God. Yeah. They're not there to start and, and we're singing praises to him. And that's not important. And people with their copies saying yeah. hi to people on the way right. in. And so, so, well, uh, so casual. That all came in just... with the felt needs thing. Right. right. When C. Peter Wagner you know, started writing these books on church growth, and then people like Rick Warren, you know, he, did his whole, he did his thesis on it about how he went door to door and asked people around the community, what do you want? What are your felt needs for a church? He was asking a lot of people who weren't even Christians. So they're, they're writing down stuff like, uh, you know, I want my latte with the, with the service, and I want really good entertainment, and I, you mm -hmm. know. And so they built their whole church around that. Instead, the whims of unsaved people. Exactly. Yeah. Instead, the church is a place for those who are born again, primarily. Yes, the it can be an outreach, but that's not the, you know, making it something that is going to make a non-Christian feel comfortable is not our job. Right. We should be there worshiping the Lord, being taught from the Word, etc. But unfortunately, it's become this real emotional, you know, experience oriented thing. And if unsaved people in the audience, now we should make them feel welcome and loved Abs and be friendly. Absolutely. But if they're not uh, shaking in the presence of a holy God, all these churches say we're bringing down the presence of God. That God's presence isn't there because. No, let alone, um, we should be shaking in the presence have, of the Holy God, but the unsaved people for sure should Unfortunately, be. a lot of Christians have, and this gets into a whole other discussion, have substituted solical things for spiritual things. The, the churches have become very solical. In other words, body and mind, and how do I feel? How is this going to make me feel? Did I feel like I worshiped the Lord? You know, Instead of it actually being a spiritual uh, a place for learning spiritually about what's going on and and uh, really meditating on God's word, but it's it's become something else. And I think a lot of people have sort of uh, become dualist. You know, it's all body and soul, and the spirit part is is left alone. Well, and, and they've mistaken the they mistake solical things for spiritual things. Well, and the, uh, I'm going to quote a a news a secular newscaster gets it. He, he called uh, the United States the United States of entertainment. And our culture mm -hmm. is so tremendously entertainment totally. driven. Uh, he was mentioning about the death of uh, the suicide death of Robin Williams. And he wasn't really cutting down on Robin Williams, but you notice that was on 24 seven. And, you know, he made the comment that hardly anyone knows what's going on in the Ukraine or Gaza or right. around the world. But he said something that really struck me is people like emotions right. more than they like facts. That's and right. practical application with Christians, well, they're wanting the experience more than the facts of correct. Scripture. And that's yeah. why 
many churches have gone away from Bible teaching. They've gone away from the gospel because what people want is an emotional experience when I come to church. If I get that emotional experience, if I get that emotional high, then I feel like I've really worshipped God. <laughs> but uh, what about teaching people, you know, from the Bible? What about people knowing their Bible? Now it's all like you get your entertainment and then you get a bunch of stories, you know, personal stories, subjective stories from from the pastor, and maybe a Bible verse thrown in. That's not teaching the Bible. Now, uh, now we're talking about emotions and uh, culture and cultural things, and I just always wondered because I, I, I saw about hula worship, you know, yeah. and, and you, you being from Hawaii, um, break it down. Uh, hula well, worship is done at Saddleback. down with that what, what the hula dance is really about well I, I have a problem with it and and some people would really disagree with me but it's the same problem I have with doing yoga in the churches mm -hmm. because yoga has a philosophy behind it and the actual movements of yoga are worship mo movements to false gods and so you can't completely divorce that you can't completely Christianize yoga well it's the same thing with hula Hula is a dance to Pele, of the false god of Hawaii, the volcanic god. And you cannot divorce those movements and the things that they're doing from, f completely from, from that background. And the second part is, is that, you know, you're, it's just, you know, it, it, I don't know a good way of putting this, but a lot of, for instance, American men, don't know what those movements that those women are doing with their hips. And the island men do. It's a very sexual thing. And so, you know, everybody's thinking, oh, this is so great, but the island men are sitting there looking at it, go, thinking different thoughts. We are not to do things in the church that cause other people to sin. But I see that all the time now well, in so many different ways. And that's one of the things that Hula is doing, unfortunately. Well, and one of the things that they would come back on uh, folks like us and say, well, that's the guy's problem for looking at the girl in no. a way of lust, but no, it's, it's the, the person's problem yeah. who is doing that particular thing, trying to supposedly worship God. I, I from my, I have always re recognized that doing music and in particular doing dance in the churches is one of the hardest things to pull off, to actually focus people's eyes on Jesus. Because especially with dance, it's all focused on you. Mm -hmm. And I've only seen a couple people that I thought could actually pull that off, get people to worship God and get, get people's eyes away from what they're doing onto the Lord. It's a very hard thing to do. It's also hard to do in music. It's a very hard, and I spent a long time trying to work that out. Because I didn't want people focusing on me. I wanted people focusing on the Lord. So it's a very difficult thing to be in the arts, and you have to be aware of those things. And it's your responsibility if you're doing those things. It's not the person, <laughs> their responsibility, because you're basically, you know, doing a performance for them. So you've got to make sure that what you're doing is, is actually glorifying to the Lord. And there's all kind of performances. Uh, sure. We have a tape of uh, uh, Nazarene Church in Ohio uh, where the girl uh, during service was doing what she calls an interpretive dance, but I took it as very pagan yeah. and very uh, sexual, in my opinion. Where it comes, flowers grow, lions sleep, gray songs flow, where death dies, all things live. Where Again, back to music. Yes. Music is so um, it can be so manipulative because yeah. it's, it does stir up feelings. We know from writing songs yeah. and those type of things. I know a lot of the preachers in the Signs and Wonders movement. They cannot preach without that Hammond B three going in the background. Yeah, well, that's you know, Benny Hinn has music going throughout his crusades and stuff. 
it's a way to manipulate people's emotions. And he, his whole thing is they have a, lo a really long crusade to the point where people are actually crying by the end, and they're all ready to be manipulated. Right. That's not what we're supposed to be doing is manipulating people. And let me be clear. I don't have a problem with emotions because it's something that the Lord created in us. You know, yes, we can have emotions about things. But if that becomes your whole definition of what worship is, then you've got a bit of a problem. You better find out what, how God wants to be worshipped. He's not looking down to see how well you raised your hands and how much dancing you did around, clapping your hands and all that. He's looking to see what your life is really like. Are you witnessing to people? Are you exhibiting the fruit of the Spirit? Unfortunately, a lot of this kind of stuff turns into stuff that's not the fruit of the Spirit. Right. It's, you know, one of the fruits of the Spirit is self-control. When people get out of control, that's not the Spirit anymore. Very fleshly. I, I've worked in a uh, church um, where uh, the worship leader always had to keep his eye on the pastor because if he did this motion, that means we were going to go into the Pentecostal two-step. Oh, yeah. And you could hear the bass line going. That yeah. Doo -doo 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 -doo. <laughs> yeah. You know, and I expe almost expected to see Dan Ankroyd or somebody <laughs> cartwheeling up the, yeah. the, the middle pews. And, exactly. And then chaos ensues. Right. And 10 to 1 after that was done, um, he, he would hit it on the tithe or something he really wanted to drive home yes. because he had created this emotional atmosphere, which people get confused with the actual presence they of do. God. They do. And it's, it's sad, you know. But like, like I was saying in that article, the lyrics to these songs are so important to make sure that we test because 10 to 1, a person, when they go home, they're not going to remember hardly anything that the pastor said. Once in a while, if they throw in a good illustration, they'll remember it. But man, they'll remember the song, and they can sing the song any time. And, it's, and that is, is teaching them. It's a teaching tool. Well, you want to make sure that those things are teaching good things, that they're teaching good sound doctrine. Sound doctrine, yes. Because if, because if not, it becomes a way to brainwash people. They keep singing this thing. Let me give you an example. I didn't like the song about uh, you, are, you are the breath, uh, you're every... Breathe. Breathe, yeah, right. you know, you're every breath I take or whatever. Not because that's not a good figurative thing to say. It's basically saying... In a figurative way, it's saying, you mean everything to me, right. which is probably what he should have said. But the problem with the song is, when you continue to repeat that in your mind, you begin to get this idea that, yeah, the Holy Spirit is everywhere, and he's, you know, uh, the Holy Spirit is, is his creation, you know? It becomes a pantheistic idea that if I breathe in, this is what Benny Hinn said, I breathe in, I breathe in the Holy Spirit. Or when I breathe out, I can't remember which it was. But it becomes this pantheistic thing. There are a number of songs that have a very pantheistic view of God. God is not his creation. God is above and apart from the things that he's created. He's not in the chair. He's not in the, you know. But that's and, what we see today. And I, I've been so amazed at how much it used to be back in the day um, some of these uh, new CCM uh, songs are not going to hold the test of time. Not like Martin no. Luther's Away in a Manger, no. Mighty Fortress is Our God, yeah. uh, Wesley's Tunes. Um, they're not going to stand the thing of time. And, and the problem is, is that we've let the culture influence right. us instead of our music influencing the, the culture. Definitely. And we're bearing fruit of an unsaved culture, that's the problem. and that's what we're doing, and that's what we're serving up to God very often on a Sunday. And it's sad. It's, it's, really, it's really quite sad. It's, and, uh, you know, there are a number of things that I actually wrote down, uh, some ideas for churches to, to actually test music, and it, this is in my worship song ratings uh, page. But I kind of want to go through this really quick and have okay. you comment on them, because... These are suggestions about how to test music and what to do and what not to do. Just some ideas. Number one, you can make any song better by not repeating phrases in the song over and over. That's what's being done today. You repeat it over and over, and maybe there's only a couple lyrics and you just keep saying them over and over again. Choruses. You know, that can only lead people to zoning out and not really thinking about what they're singing. Pretty soon they're, not, they're, they're into the beat. 
they're not thinking about what they're actually singing to the Lord. Mm -hmm. So I say sing more songs, more songs instead of singing a few songs over and over until people are numb. Hey, you can do more songs and sing it once through or twice through and then go on to the next thing. Number two, avoid songs that focus on self, repeating words like I, me, mine, and mine throughout. Dave Hunt, before he went, left us, he, he, he was on that particular soapbox. He said, I really don't like a lot of the stuff that's in churches today. It's all about me. I'm going to worship. I'm going to do this. Uh, wait a minute. Isn't this supposed to be about the Lord? So I say choose songs that focus people on Jesus Christ. That's the way to go. You want to glorify His attributes. You don't want to be talking about, I'm going to do this, or I, you know, it's all focused on me. But we're in the me generation, and that's why we have so right. much of that. Very self-centered. And our, our worship is not focused on, on God. That's the problem. Yeah, it's you, you, building you up You think about a mighty fortress is our God, the song that you said. It's all focused on God. It's on His attributes. Those are the best kinds of songs. Number three, test all music, both new and old. There are good... There are bad old songs and good new ones. Mm -hmm. And I showed this in this page. So you have to, you know, there we were talking about a song that, that, that was written a long time ago. Many churches have done this song called Majesty. It's a nice song, but it, there's one uh, phrase in the song. There's a, there's a section of the song that's basically talk, teaching dominionism. We need to take over the world. And that got slipped in, man, and a lot of people have sung that. I was singing that right, song, and I yeah. didn't even realize what was wrong with it until I looked at it again. Number four, if a songwriter or music publisher is affiliated with a heretical or compromised church or movement, those false teachings will eventually come through in the compositions. You know, find out what they're involved with, because then you will be, be able to actually see what's, what's going on with the songs. Um, number five, consider mixing up musical styles. A church can get into a rut focusing on only contemporary music, just as easily as they say the old churches were in a rut with the hymns, you know. Um, choose a mixture of both old and new and different methods of delivery, you know. D mix it up. Keep, a, keep people off kilter. I really like this one church that used to support us up in Alaska. They were a new church. And when they organized the church, they had a lot. They found out they had a lot of musicians from different backgrounds. Mm -hmm. So they ended up putting together four worship teams. Uh, one was contemporary. One was hard rock. One was like uh, classical. Another one was jazz. And they would have those guys switch off, and nobody knew who was playing the next Sunday. It was exciting, mm -hmm. you know. I know that not everybody can do that, but you know, mix up the styles a little bit. Contemporary. CCM gets boring after a while. Yeah, it's pretty it really, shallow stuff. It, 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 it's just, when you do one thing over and over, it, it gets boring. Number six, don't foster the habit of having people clap on every upbeat song. I, I'm, I'm from a Calvary Chapel, and they do that. They, they clap on everything. And it's, con, you know, it's just... It's like we become, do at the rock concert. Yeah, it's become this thing that you kind of have to do. And I just don't think that's a good thing. Uh, number seven, consider, if possible, having more than one worship team, and that's what I just, uh, you know, talked about. Hey, do the, have a service where you do the old stuff, where somebody plays the organ or, or piano. Um, number eight, choose songs that glorify God, teach sound doctrine, and teach about God's character. And all, all music should include that. The, it, all, the, all the worship music we do should include those, those aspects. Right. And there's no reason not to, you know. And then finally, uh, number nine, establish a committee of elders, pastors, and worship leaders to make sure that worship music is being used, uh, that, that good worship music is being used in your church. Um, I, I really received a lot of help and mentoring when I started out in music. They helped me, or let me see your song. How, you know, how are the lyrics? Uh, that looks good, but why, why not change this, this line? And I appreciated that. And I think a lot of musicians actually would when they're writing music for the church. We need to give help to these guys because a lot of times the musicians are younger people and they're not maybe as mature in the Lord. Mm -hmm. And they might say something that's not right biblically. 
Mm -hmm. They need some help. And there's no reason not to help them. It's not, a lot of pastors are afraid to help, you know, the, the younger people because they think they're going to turn them off and they won't want to do it anymore. But I don't believe that's the case at all. No, I believe uh, most young people enjoy mentoring, you know, yeah. because it gives them attention, yeah. shows that you care about their spiritual that's life. That's right. I don't see any problem with it. And that way you are actually checking. If somebody's going to do special music in your church, just say, can, can I see what the song is, you know, yeah. and, and take a look at it and make sure that it's okay because sometimes, man, people can sing stuff and it's like way out there. And not only that, make sure they're not using the joyful noise verse. Make sure they actually have the gifting. There's a lot of people who would like to stand on the platform and sing who are never gifted with that talent, well, you know. Well, I'm of the opinion that if you're going to put together a worship band for your, or a worship group for your church, whatever it may be, that you ought to actually have tryouts for it. You ought, uh, it oh, actually should be a yes. situation where you know if the person can actually do it. I know people want to give people an opportunity to sing, and you know maybe maybe a good time for that would be to have a talent night and have let people do their thing. Mm -hmm. But when you have somebody there that's going to be there every Sunday or every meeting leading worship, you need people who actually know what they're doing. Yeah, because poor playing and poor singing is actually a distraction. It's a, it's a big distraction. Mm -hmm. And of course, you also want to teach people, you want to bring people's level up of their understanding of music. A lot of people, you know, they don't really listen critically to music. So you want to bring their music appreciation up with those things instead of bringing it down. And a lot of times churches just get into this really bad situation where people are just grumbling about, you know, the bad music being, being played. Right, right. Now, uh, um, uh, uh, just to go off on a tangent a little bit, it still has to do with sound and music. You, you did a lot of commercials, so you know that music is so powerful. Certain things oh. will make people chipper. And, Absolutely. And when you were, when you, when you were doing uh, commercial jingles and different sounds and all that, how did you decide what sounds and what things, uh, well, you know? Well, you know, the, the advertiser would come and say, you know, this is, this is what we want to achieve. And we would go through, ask a whole series of questions, uh, what they wanted to achieve. And we would try to get the kind of music that would really set the mood for what they, what they wanted to sell. And, uh, yeah, there's some real tricks. I mean, I often watch commercials and I can see the tricks in them that they're using to, yeah. to get people over. And um, so, yeah, it, it matters what, you know, how you're presenting things because um, it, it will teach people. And they may not even know that they're being swayed in a certain way, you know. Because sounds are important. I found uh, uh, in the uh, Bill Johnson book, The uh, Physics of Heaven, an interesting uh, spin on different sounds. And these are various quotes from individuals from that book that Bill Johnson was a part of. Let me read some of those quotes. This book is just a precursor to the revelation that God is going to give us when he releases a new transforming sound. We're talking about 10 minutes the power uh, uh, times the power that was released at Pentecost. 10 times the power. Yeah, again, they always got to one-up everything from the scriptures. Uh, the sound God desires to release will chase religion from the church and bring truth. <laughs> They've always turned it. We're the Pharisees now, the people that have discernment. Yeah, it's like religion is a bad thing. Of course, I guess they haven't read James where he says true religion is, is this. Yes. You know? And so I think you know, they've made religion into a bad word, but there's, there is a good aspect to religion as well. And they go on to say, we suspect, uh, suspect God is up to something new, something that will transform us at the deep, deepest level of who we are 
and will be ushered in by a new form of sound or vi uh, and or vibration. This coming new sound can change DNA. Mm. Uh, so we are <laughs> genetically growing up. Your genetics are the same as his, Big H, was. Our genetics came out of the Father and our spirit. We are becoming like an instrument uh -oh. being tuned while our genetics are getting aligned with the Father's genetics mm. in harmony with him. And the last quote is, what if there really are good vibrations that God has embedded into everything he created and we just need to be open to experiencing them? And I, I think what they're talking about is the church in Revelation 17 setting, setting that up. And it's blatantly new age. I mean, we've been talking That's a lot new in this, in this DVD, um, uh, uh, the, the quantum spirituality, all that type well, yeah, of stuff. Yeah, it also comes from it, new thought. This it, whole thing, you know, it's like we're going to be deified somehow by the sound before we're resurrected. Well, we're looking forward to the resurrection because that's when we get the new body. We're not, we're not going to have this body changed by some sound that is emitted. It's not going to, it's not going to happen. We're still living here in the, in the body and mind that God created in us. If we're born again, we have a new spirit, but we're waiting for the new body and the new soul. So, you know, these guys are like preempting all that. It's like, this is basically manifest sons of God teaching, which says that we're going to be glorified and deified before Jesus even comes back. With the new sound. Exactly. And in our this, genetics. This alleged sound. You know, i, I got to be honest with you. This kind of stuff, if this had been said 40 years ago, this guy would have been carted off to a funny farm. Right. Because that is weird stuff there. And, and part of the problem, um, in conclusion, part of the problem, I, I think are the pastors, and we mentioned this yesterday, that the hirelings, uh, when Jesus described a hireling, he said he opened the gate uh, for the wolf to come in. Well, uh, well no, actually, uh, excuse me, that was, that was incorrect. He, uh, the, the, uh, he ran away. He ran away. Yeah. But now these new hirelings, which are worse than what yeah. even Jesus said hirelings were, open the gate, they open the let, gate them, let them in, let false teachers in, yep. get, your, get the local churches, we had this happen in Lima. Our uh, community w uh, was exposed by a, the Nazarene pastor there, Doug Boquist, to Dan Bohai, who we've spoken about previously in this DVD. And uh, at first in the church that I was at, at Calvary Chapel, Chapel Lima, Mike Spaulding actually let me uh, speak about fire school and Dan Bohai and the false teachings and stuff like that. Well, that changed. Sometimes they'll circle the wagons, even if that pastor is wrong. Because in, our, in the church I went to, we had a full row of Nazarenes that had left that church uh, from previous pastor and stuff. They, were, they had been previously teaching open theism, all kind of stuff. And I had actually warned Doug about Bohai and, you know, let him decide for himself. And, of course, he did. He chose to still allow this teacher into there. But then once you try to correct, uh, even in humility, try to collect, cor correct a pastor, that, that, that's not taken in. So number one, no. they're not watching what's coming into the church, which is right. a problem. And they're and, not, and they're uncorrectable. And, and, and this uh, uh, pastor, Mike Spaulding, uh, who just recently has a radio station now mixed with some good teaching, but some real sketchy teaching as well. Um, he wrote, wrote an article, uh, and he didn't use, say me directly, but um, <laughs> he, he said, uh, a few thoughts I've, I've spent some time on recently. Why do some Christians spend so much time on things that are counterproductive and do not build the kingdom of God in the least? Examples of what I see are making a supposed career of shouting at the darkness. Does the darkness listen? Does it even care? Or is this exercise more about puffing up the one shouting? Brothers and sisters, we are called to preach the gospel of Jesus, the light of the world. Let's remember to focus on that. And he also goes on to say making a supposed career out of Greek critiquing the church. Almost every believer knows at least one of these kind of people. They are third, thrilled to finally have a church home when they first arrive on the scene. It isn't long before the criticism starts, though, after a time that is characterized by trying to enlist other people in their hobby horse ideolo ideology, the critics disappear. The reason is always the same. The church or the pastor is off base and slipping into air, the hobby horse theologian warned about. Which, there's so many holes in that, we observed in that church a Greg Laurie 
uh, his uh, Harvest America thing, and Kurt Franklin was on that, and he was just vulgar on it. He was flat out vulgar. It was it was a disgusting display of self and and fleshly carnal stuff. And I stormed out of the. I was upset, especially coming home with music, but. Nobody said anything, you know. Mm -hmm. And then later, when he, even though he corrected, and what, uh, they they stated at that point there was not going to be any Harvest America, didn't say what was wrong, kind of glossed over it. And that's what I see. They kind of gloss over this, even though they may not pre be preaching strange doctrine. They're not doing anything. They're hirelings. It, they're, they're hirelings, and they're, and, they're, they and they're they're more concerned about discernment ministries. Uh, you know, wanting that, and it's it's not just happening in Calvary Chapel Lima. It's happening in church. We no, get emails on that all the time. These guys are not listening to anybody. It does include the discernment people, but they're also not listening to the people in their church. And what we have to remember about wolves is, when they're let in, they are there to eat the flock, and they will take your flock and make it into something different than what it was before. They will eat them. They'll devour them. They'll ruin their faith. And this is the problem we have today. We've got pastors out there that call themselves pastors, but they can't ever accept any kind of uh, correction. They cannot, they apparently don't know anything about uh, actually repenting, which makes you wonder, are they actually saved? Did they ever repent of their sins? Because they're so thin-skinned that they can't actually talk about issues. They have to immediately jump to, uh, you know, epithets like this. And I, you know, the, the one big logic hole that you started out with, he says you're shouting at the darkness. Is he saying he's darkness? These guys don't even know the, their own logic. They're, they're off. And actually we're shedding the light of Scripture of on, course. on dark things. Well, you know, the, the, the thing is, we are supposed to shout at darkness. We're supposed to, we're supposed to, uh, preach the gospel so that the darkness, you know, goes away from people. Um, you know, there, there are times and places to deal with issues. Not everything is a positive confession thing. Sometimes we actually have to, to deal with things, and that's what we're talking about with this, the, the, the music. We have got to deal with the, the issues of the music, or else people are going to end up derailed. But we've got to be guardians. You've got to be a watchman in your church. When the, when the enemy's coming, you better shout and allow people and, and let people know that the enemy's around. But these guys aren't willing to do that. Well, and we, again, we need to show that worship doesn't mean just music. Right. Worship is our lifestyle. Worship takes place. Everybody can put on a show in the church. Right. But you, once you walk out those doors... That's when That's your right. real worship lifestyle is apparent on what you do, That's how, what it you, is. how you live your life. It's on how that. you live and how you are glorifying the Lord and how you are obeying His commands. That's the big one. You show the Lord that you love Him, not by uh, acting out in church, but actually by obeying uh, the Scripture. And to obey the Scripture, you have to know the Scripture. So it needs to be taught, and not just in, from the pulpit. It needs to be in the songs. Right. It needs to be in the library. It needs to be in every aspect of your church. That's why, as the leader of that church, it's your responsibility, along with the elders, to make sure that things are going down the right path. Because otherwise, it's your responsibility. It says about the watchman that if people get killed, their blood is going to be required on your head. And that's what people don't understand, man. They're in charge of God's flock. It's not their flock. It's God's flock. Right. And if they're allowing things to come in that hurt the flock, then they're not doing their job. And they become hirelings. And what, what's the use of a hireling? They just run away when anything happens. No, we need people who are going to stand and stand for what's right in the churches. As well as choosing a good song selection. Exactly. A lot, a lot of times they'll leave that up to the worship leader which is a good thing if their worship leader is uh, theologically if aware, sound. Yeah. But every aspect of a church service, every aspect we, where we meet as a fellowship, for sure, should be focused on God. That's right. Not on a painting, right. um, prophetically painting, or the latest fad, right. or the late, and certainly not secular music yeah. like 
um, highway to hell. Why would you even do that? And the problem is, is pastors are so incredibly busy yeah. that they don't take the time, and now they're starting to not heed the warnings. Um, you know, we, let's end it on a, on a positive note, because um, a lot of people are finding that their church is getting goofy. This is the end times, great falling away. Second Thessalonians 2, the Bible already said that this was going to happen, yes, the great did. falling away, meaning falling away from the faith, which includes pastors as well. So, Sandy, in conclusion, how would you uh, encourage people um, that are perhaps floating around and, and, and kind of aimlessly and, and really don't know what to do anymore um, as far as finding a good fellowship well, and finding good music It's in becoming the increasingly today. difficult, and I get a lot of emails to this effect. I live in this certain place, and do you know at a good church? And a lot of times I don't. I don't, you know, I don't actually have the context to know uh, about a good church. The thing to do is to ask certain questions when you are looking for a good church. You need to ask some serious questions to the pastor and then see what their response is. I did this when I first came to Hawaii. I, I was casting around looking for some different churches. And I would ask them specific questions like, what is your attitude toward Benny Hinn? Or, you know, uh, do you think that the Brownsville revival was a real revival from God? And some of those kinds of questions, because it's very enlightening when you get their answers back. You find out where the person's act actually at. So I, I encourage people to ask, write them a nice letter, but ask them some questions that they already know what the answer should be. And if they don't give the right answer, like if they give the wrong answer, of course, but if they give like a namby-pamby answer, you know, like, well, there's good and there's bad, you know, don't go to that church, man. And if they give you a form letter back, it's yeah, been typed right. up for, for sure. Or they call you up that. and tell you never to write them a letter like that, which yeah. would be fairly typical these days. You know, people are just not, they're not really being pastors. They're very thin-skinned about everything, and they want everything to be their way. And they think they're the, the anointed one, and no one else can talk to them about anything. Well, you know what? We have things to learn from people, and we better open our ears and listen to, especially when, you know, people in your church are saying, this is not good, what's going on? You better take that seriously and not just, like, you know, just shove it off. Because sooner or later, they're going to give an account That's to the right. Lord, directly to the Lord. That's right. And, and I often wonder um, how seriously some of those guys are taking it. But this is... Uh, our conversation was about testing music in the church, yes. and Sandy has a great uh, worship song rating uh, on his uh, uh, website, yes. which is uh, Deception in the Church, yes. and you can go there. Sandy's always updating that. Yeah. I have a couple of DVDs with, with, the, with the two articles I wrote on testing, in the, testing music in the church, and so maybe those will be helpful to you, but uh, just so with some ideas about how to how to make things better, how to, how, to, how to do the music part of the, the services better. Okay. Well, thank you, Sandy. And, and uh, uh, again, a lot of times we bring up the bad news, but the good news is, is that Jesus will return. He will make things right. Uh, and even in there, there, are, there is a remnant. There always will be a remnant, and there's yeah. still good fellowships That's out right. there. So just pray about it, uh, seek a good church, uh, interview your pastor. Uh, you want to know what you're uh, getting into. I'd, I'd suggest also to go to a couple services and right. uh, uh, see what he's see preaching. What it's like. you know? yeah. See what it's like. Yeah. That's the best way. Yes, I, I appreciate that word of encouragement. I mean, you know, Elijah was feeling very alone. And uh, he went up in the mountains and said, you know, am I the only person left in Israel? And God reminded him, no. I have 7,000 people who will not bow the knee to, to Baal. And I think that was a very big encouragement to him. He didn't realize that, yeah, God always has his faithful remnant out there. People who are really concerned about worshiping him and, and following him and, and, and uh, showing, them, showing him that they love him by their obedience. So don't forget that. Don't think like you're all alone. There are other people struggling with these issues too. Mm -hmm. And there are still some good churches out there, but you just have to try to find them. So in conclusion, uh, this message and this DVD was to let you know that you're not alone. And uh, just pray about it, and uh, God bless you. Uh, thank you for your time. Mm -hmm.
you were a friend of mine I'd hate to think you thought you had me fooled Sometimes the world can shine so shiny bright It's like deflects the truth away from you I've seen you scramble for the dollar one Instead of taking time for what is real You think you put one over on everyone But there's always another wheel within a wheel 